welcome to Trend Lines, a podcast on global affairs brought to you by World Politics Review. I'm Elliot Waldman. Before we dive into today's interview, just a quick reminder to tune in again on Friday for our editor's discussion, looking at the week's top headlines. The coronavirus pandemic has shaken up just about every aspect of human society, and elections have been no exception, at least in countries that have them. While some democratic nations that saw early success in containing the virus's spread, like South Korea, have been able to hold national elections safely, a slew of other countries have been forced to postpone their votes or have made drastic modifications to the process in order to avoid contagion. The pandemic has also changed the facts on the ground for the people we might call the referees of democracy, independent election observers who are tasked with determining how freely and how fairly the balloting was conducted. My guest for today has spent his career deeply involved in this world, and he's here to provide a glimpse into how election observers are adapting to a world that's been drastically altered by COVID-19. David Carroll is director of the Democracy Program at the Carter Center. He's participated in dozens of observation missions and elections around the world and has been at the forefront of efforts to develop standards and best practices for global election observation. David, welcome to Trendlines. Hi, Elliot. Nice to be here. Thank you. Just to start off, I was hoping you could briefly outline the history of election observation, because I think uh, there are a lot of listeners who might not be too familiar with it. So how did it start? How did it become so commonplace to the point where now most elections in democratic societies are witnessed by independent observers? So um, actually, there's there's quite a long history of election observation. It goes back um, hundreds of years, actually. Um, but um, I'm kind of fuzzy on a lot of the ancient history. I think probably more relevant to your listeners is modern day election observation, which uh, typically most of us date around the end of the Cold War uh, and the the kind of the change in international relations after that. There were certainly instances of modern election observation in the few decades before that, but that's when it really took off. And I think it was in part a a reflection of the fact that um, democracy could really be embraced as a legitimate foreign policy goal by a lot of the West, given that the, uh, the Cold War tensions had kind of taken a back seat uh, in U.S. foreign policy. Um, And I would say, so from the late 80s till now, it's it's evolved quite a bit. It's become a lot more commonplace, many more actors involved, and a a growth of a community of practice that has become better and more professional over time. Um, But at the same time, trying to stay uh, up to speed with a rapidly changing world and the context in which elections take place. So while we've gotten a lot better, the challenges um, have only multiplied. So what does election day look like from an observer's perspective? What are the main things you're watching out for and trying to assess? So, um, you know, I'll I'll speak to election day, um, but just will want to emphasize that that's a pretty limited part of what we do, um, but it is the part that most people, um, I think, you know, imagine in their minds when they think of elections observers, because that's the, you know, the the moment when you can see teams of people with their identifying shirts and hats, and there's a lot of photos in the media, uh, and so that's really the image that um, people associate. So, but what it really looks like on election day is pretty simple uh, compared to a lot of the other other aspects of what we do. Um, there's a, a standard uh, questionnaire checklist that is developed uh, for the country at hand, you know, derived from a kind of a, a, a generic standard uh, checklist, and a, uh, it really incorporates some of the specifics of the country and the election process that we're looking at. But it entails you know, large numbers of what we call short-term observers. They're there for uh, a week to two weeks at the most. And on election day, after they've been briefed and they've spent several days in the areas around where they will be deployed, they are going around to polling stations throughout the course of the day, filling out that standard checklist. Um, and it asks you know, a wide variety of questions about the environment uh, in the polling area, immediately outside the polling station, inside the polling station, what the process looks like. Is it following the established legal procedures and electoral regulations? Does it meet key internationally recognized standards for um, 
an election with integrity and um, what kinds of persons have access, importantly, to that polling station. Most importantly, are our party agents from the main candidates allowed, our independent observers allowed, you know, how transparent is what's happening at that process, um, and are there any other um, signs that are, are worrying in any way about how the, the process is, is administered. And so that goes on throughout the course of the day, and those uh, forms are completed and relayed back to some um, call center throughout the course of the day and, you know, developing our sense of what what's transpired on election day, knowing that um, it may vary quite significantly from you know, observer area to, to different areas around the country. And that's just election day. You know, I don't know if you want me to go into election night and, and the, the days that, that follow that. Well, I was also hoping you could talk about the lead up to election day, the campaigning period, because I would imagine that plays a pretty significant role in determining whether an election was conducted freely and fairly. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that, and then we could get into the election night and the aftermath. I'll actually kind of go back to the beginning for us, because there's quite a bit before the campaign period generally, too. Um, we we start, first of all, um, you know, we, we have to be uh, invited and accredited by whatever is the appropriate um, host country authority. Typically, it's an elections commission, but it might be um, some other arm of government, a foreign ministry might be involved, so that we are there um, with the expressed uh, um, acceptance of the host country and uh, generally widely welcomed by the major political forces that are contending the election. We don't think that we can be effective if there's um, a major political force that really objects to our presence, uh, either from the government or the opposition. So we we try to be there with that kind of basic framework. Um, you know, in an ideal world, if the circumstances will allow, we are starting a field operation many months before election day. Um, you know, we we tend to uh, try to be on the ground at a minimum of three months before an election, if possible. Uh, but there's been occasions when we've been there six months, even nine months or a year before an election, actual election, uh, sometimes because election dates have, have been delayed and we end up being there for, for quite a long time. But uh, that mission will start with a core team of experts who will be doing a lot of analysis and meeting with key stakeholders from the parties, civil society, uh, other uh, international groups and citizen groups that might be involved in some way or other related to the elections, and trying to just really deeply understand the full context that the elections will be taking place in. Um, in, in addition to the laws, we'll look at other preparations um, that are being made by the election administration, um, how they are um, preparing for um, holding the elections, their, loca their selection of voting locations, um, any process that is underway or completed already on voter registration and identification of voters, um, plans for activities that relate to voter education. All of those things um, may have happened you know, well before the campaign period, but the campaign period itself is also extremely critical. And during the campaign uh, which may be as short as 30 days in some countries. Um, in some countries, it's it's less regulated. Um, we usually have a team of long-term observers who are on the ground um, months before an election during the campaign campaign period. And they will be traveling around the country and observing both campaign activities and the conditions with which they're held. Say, for example, are there any obstacles to having um, rallies organized? Are there any um, conflicts between different groups? Uh, any impediments to the kind of activity that's required to, uh, to organize campaigns, to um, getting your messages broadcast on the radio and to buy political advertising. All of those things are assessed during the campaign period. Um, you know, quite often, uh, what turns out to be um, a particularly important issue is if there's any obstacles actually in the law or that the government 
may have used to prevent certain persons from from running, and so that may uh, you know become a major problem before a campaign even starts if there's um, laws or other legal actions that take place that um, make it impossible for um, you know some candidates or or possible candidates to participate. That's probably uh, one of the things that ends up being. You know, one of the most important ways that uh, election integrity is undermined when certain candidates are prevented from from participating. In some cases, we and other observers have just decided to to not get involved if a leading candidate's not uh, allowed to participate. So, what happens after polls have closed? Uh, ballots are being counted. Uh, results are starting to trickle in. What kind of role do election observers play during that period? So from the close of the elections until a declaration of final results uh, and ultimately even the resolution of any legal challenges that, that might be filed can actually be quite a long period of time. But um, you know, starting from that end of day closing of, of the polls, uh, now in, in almost every country, there's immediate counting of ballots at the polling station, which is an important part of transparency. Uh, and so observers are at a selection of polling sites um, where we watch the count, which can go on for hours. Um, but then this is where the, the really difficult parts come in, because those uh, election results then need to be relayed, oftentimes in multiple formats, electronically and on paper, um, in various copies, to several layers of election administration up to then be uh, integrated into a national result. And so part of the challenge is ensuring that what might look like a a good count at the polling station level uh, is actually turns out to be a transparent, verifiable result when you get to national tabulated results, which sometimes can be a matter of, um, you know, a day or two to, you know, a week or more. Um, and that's where the, the post-election assessment of those processes is extremely tedious, time-consuming, and quite often uh, difficult to fully observe. And so there, we, there's, there's a lot of different strategies that need to be employed in that, in that process. Um, when results uh, when results are finally declared, there's often um, legal challenges, and those can sometimes go on for a protracted period of time. Uh, and to the extent that uh, we're able to, we try to fully observe and assess those legal processes and how they unfold. I know there was a case in Malawi recently where an election was overturned by the high court there after uh, ballots were found to be altered with uh, correctional fluid. Uh, after the fact, among other irregularities. I would imagine that's the kind of thing that uh, observers would want to make sure they're tracking, but that the people who are doing it might try to hide. So what are some of the things uh, election observers can do to make sure that misconduct like that is uh, in full view? So the the, the key element in um, detecting that kind of manipulation goes back again to the um, ability to have uh, access at the polling station level to observe counts and to get a pretty systematic uh, set of data from those polling stations. And then uh, in parallel or, or in the succeeding days, to be able to check that against what is um, being released at a national level in a consolidated vote count but necessarily showing the individual polling station results so that there's a chance to really compare what, what we've seen at a polling station level and, and an analysis of the samples that we've drawn or that other observers uh, have drawn against what is uh, presented nationally. The, the problems and that's, you know, the unacceptable level of um, you know, a lack of transparency is when there's just a total result that's released or um, a few high-level consolidated results without showing uh, transparently and early in the process what are those polling station level results that that are used to to generate the national level result. If if that's provided, there's usually a pretty good way to detect if there's manipulation that has occurred without needing to, you know, see the actual manipulation taking place. If there's enough data there, it's usually quite... um, 
not so difficult to to show that there's been a problem. You mentioned earlier that generally authorities will invite election observers in and uh, that you all will only participate uh, if there's buy-in from all sides. Tell us a little bit about what's in it for the uh, government as well as for the opposition. What do they gain from having independent election observers uh, participate in the electoral process? So, you know, it's, it varies um, by country, but in general, I would say that um, you know, because international observation has developed into being a, a widespread norm that's uh, accepted and looked to as um, helping to give a stamp of legitimacy, governments may not always be you know, really thrilled and happy to have international observers there, but they may feel like it's going to be critical or know that um, there will be political pressure from other actors, maybe international actors, for them to be open to observers. Uh, some countries are, are really quite um uh, happy and confident to um, to invite international observers. Um, it's you know, typically if there's um, opposition, it's probably a you know a government that may have some uh, doubts about its um, you know, democratic credentials, and there may be um, concerns that they're trying to hide something. So that that might be um, you know in situations like that. There are sometimes governments that are that are very hesitant to invite observers, but it really is that um, extra stamp of approval of legitimacy that comes with having an outside group or outside groups that really have the track record of doing credible election observation that I think adds to the equation for them that makes it a situation where they, they're comfortable enough having observers there. Perhaps due to the nature of the work you all do, election observation missions are often politicized. We saw an example of this recently in Bolivia, where the Organization of American States uh, issued some very serious allegations of fraud against the government for the way it tabulated votes in last year's disputed election, uh, in which uh, Evo Morales uh, appeared to have won re-election, but uh, subsequently was um, ousted from office as as a result of mass protests. To the extent that these kinds of accusations are something observers can control, what are some steps you all take to prevent uh, your work from becoming politicized? Yeah, that's a good question. It's um, as you say, it's uh, it's political by nature. The kinds of things that we do, and it's not uncommon for um, our work to become, um, you know, a point of contention in, in a country, uh, given the the kinds of you know political stakes that are that are playing out. Um, and so I would say it's just about uh, as frequent as not that there's some kind of critique um, of the observation group's work from one side or the other, just by the nature of the fact that one side is going to lose and they're probably going to be unhappy with losing. Uh, so you know, it's it comes with the job, it comes with the terrain, but there are, the main thing that observers can do is to be... Um, you know, as thorough as possible in their work to really strive to be clear in our analysis and in our methods and how we are gathering data and how we are assessing data against what kind of criteria and just to, to you know ensure that we're doing our work with as much integrity as possible so that there is a recognition that that's an organization that really does credible, independent observation work. And so you know, that, that's all you can really do, frankly. Um, well, I guess I would say, I guess one other thing that can be done is um, to regularly be in touch with key electoral stakeholders. So that as part of that um, work that is done to show people, to show uh, stakeholders uh, the methods that you are using and the data that you're gathering, that there's a chance to be interacting with them in some kind of regular way so that they, they know your work and they, they know that you are um, doing it professionally. Now, a handful of countries have held elections so far during the coronavirus pandemic. And as I mentioned during my introduction, some of them have been able to hold votes safely and freely, uh, others not so much. What would you say are some of the most important takeaways so far about how the nuts and bolts of organizing an election are changing as a result of COVID-19? 
So obviously this is a, um, uh, an issue and a challenge that is you know, right upon us, and it's playing out in different ways across the world in, in, in countries uh, trying to come to terms with how to, to administer elections uh, and concerns, frankly, from, from many in the international community that um, COVID could be misused and ex- as an excuse to somehow delay elections or to s- control the process in a way that um, you know, disadvantages their, their opponents. So, um, you know, we, we don't have a lot of data points yet. You know, there's been a few elections held. Um, it's, as I've said, it's going to vary widely by country context, the extent to which, uh, you know, COVID is, is large scale and widespread, uh, you know, and we know that that is uneven around the world. Uh, certainly where the, the, the virus is, is, you know, is present and there are concerns that it is, uh, you know, likely to be spread, the, the precautions need to be much greater, both from the side of election administrators uh, and the steps, the procedures they put in place, and for citizens and their willingness to actually go to polling stations. Uh, And it also changes the work of of international observers and and what we're able to do. I would say it's also evolving as our knowledge of the virus is, is evolving. What we know now about the virus and how it's transmitted is not what we thought we knew necessarily you know, a month or two or three ago. And so the, 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 the work that we do and how elections are administered is, is having to take place in that changing context. A number of countries are uh, deliberating right now on you know, whether or not to hold elections as planned. Several have, have decided to delay them, uh, in some cases, many months. Some have uh, gone to short delays and are developing plans to implement elections and to uh, ensure that there are precautions taken. Uh, and that can involve both, uh, you know, f- physical protective equipment and, uh, you know, s- efforts to sanitize polling stations to um, ensure that there's you know, greater control of queues and, and distance between people in lines and ways to uh, keep social distance, physical distance on election day between individual voters and, f- and polling staff. Also, you know, completely different kinds of approaches, such as um, having more uh, early voting days or spreading elections over multiple days as ways to address the, um, the concentration of voters and to uh, uh, try to ensure that there's less opportunity for uh, virus to be uh, spread or contact points to, to be there. And turning to um, online um, techniques so that there's more online voting or other ways to, for citizens to engage without being physically present and for election authorities to, to do more of their work um, in ways that minimize that direct contact with, with citizens and, uh, and election officials. So I would say in short, again, um, this is an ongoing challenge and everyone is still trying to get our heads around how best to confront this. And, you know, we're, we're seeing this in elections like we're seeing it in many other spheres of, of our day-to-day lives where it's, it's a constant adjustment in the face of, of new information. Do you have an example where you or your team uh, observed an election over the past few months? And maybe you could share with us a case from that that sort of illustrates the, uh, the challenge of having to adapt to these new uh, conditions that we're all under in the context of observation for elections? So we haven't had uh, an election observation mission since the outbreak of the virus in any, uh, you know, larger numbers. We were observing elections in Guyana in early March as the scale of the pandemic was just starting to become clear. And, um, you know, there were no cases in Guyana uh, by the time that we left the country, and we haven't done uh, an election observation mission since then. We are planning um, several activities connected to elections um, this year and early next year. We're looking closely at elections in Bolivia, where we, we hope to be involved, and those are currently scheduled uh, in uh, early September, I believe September 6th. And um, it's not 100% clear to us how 
we're going to engage there in part because of, of the virus, but also just to other resource um, questions that we have to deal with on our side. We're also looking at Myanmar, where they just announced elections for November 8th, and Cote d'Ivoire in the fall as well. I think all of these are still um, subject, even um, Bolivia, subject to you know, the possibility that there could be decisions to further delay them. We're, we're looking at um, assessing the role of social media in Ethiopia. And those elections were supposed to be in August of this year, and they've been postponed for probably almost a year now. I don't think we, we have a date, but it, it's now looking like next summer. So there's a, a good deal of uh, you know, reassessing timelines and plans. I suspect that um, we will need to be doing a lot more analysis remotely. We'll be needing to decide if it's safe for, observe, for many of our observers to, to travel in large numbers or if we'll be uh, limited to only smaller teams or perhaps you know, in some cases it just won't be uh, advisable to have people, uh, internationals traveling um, to observe elections, again, depending upon on the context. We, we will um, in all cases, uh, not unlike what we've done you know, traditionally in our work, but um, an even heightened importance of doing so in this context, we will be needing to do a lot of uh, collaboration and information sharing with other groups that are looking at the elections, including uh, local citizen observation groups. Um, to the extent that they're uh, working and engaging in elect uh, election observation activity, we would also want to uh, exchange as much information as possible to you know, verify that our assessments are uh, consistent with the assessments that they're finding. To what extent would you say the pandemic is opening up uh, new ways in which democratic elections can be undermined? I'm thinking of um, bans on rallies to comply with uh, restrictions on movement that could uh, unfairly advantage an incumbent uh, or the potential for uh, all these remote methods that you mentioned, like voting by mail or, uh, you know, participation online, uh, opening up new ways uh, of being tampered. How much of a concern would you say that is? These are important concerns. There's no doubt about it. They're not fundamentally different from the kinds of concerns that we've had in the past. It's just a different set of reasons, but the scale and the seriousness of these make it, I think, a little bit more complicated. Um, you know, there's there's internet shutdowns. There's you know, trumped up legal reasons for crackdowns or for delays of elections. So the, the kinds of things that are potentially that that happened that could be of concern to us that are uh, signals of anti-democratic behavior or clamping down on fundamental rights that should be present during an electoral process. Uh, they're not new, uh, but it's the context of the, the, the virus and the pandemic that we know is actually a real problem. So it's really a question of, are these being used uh, in a way that really is designed to undermine democratic elections? And so that's what we're trying to pay close attention to. Uh, you know, if there's a delay, it should be a reasonable delay. It should not be a, you know, an extended, unwarranted delay. It should be based on an assessment of the degree to which the pandemic is, is really a concern. Um, are the activities taken that limit um, the ability of citizens and others to to go out, to campaign, to do other electoral activities? Are they proportionate to the risks um, and the danger of, of the virus? Uh, are decisions and actions taken uh, around election events and dates done in a way that really is uh, based on you know, objective assessment of, of the conditions and also in consultation with key um, political and electoral stakeholders. Those are probably the, the overriding questions that we would be paying the most attention to. I think um, one other element of this that is um, amplifying the challenge of the last five years or so is uh, the online information environment uh, around elections and the increasing uh, challenges of disinformation and uh, hate speech and harassment online and um, the lack of uh, 
clear transparency about how online content is managed and generated and um, you know, spending for online content. And those are some of the challenges that the election observation community has been really focused on in the last several years. How can we do our assessment of that information and how it's generated and controlled and how it, the impact it has on an election process. And so we're layering over that, this whole question of the COVID pandemic and what are you know, legitimate health concerns that can be weaponized and used in ways uh, to undermine election integrity. So by this point, the virus has been with us for over six months. And I wonder if we're approaching a point where electoral commissions and authorities in democratic countries have enough information to go on and enough preparation time to be able to hold elections safely and fairly. Uh, You mentioned Myanmar and Bolivia as two countries that have elections coming up. The United States has a big one coming up this fall. Are all these countries uh, ready, or is it going to be something that democracies are adjusting to uh, in the months and years to come? I think, in short, the answer is uh, the latter. We're, we're going to be adjust, adjusting to this, uh, certainly for the you know the coming three, six months, year, and may, maybe a good deal longer. I think the scale of the problem is such that, again, depending upon the country, there's there's sufficient awareness of what we're up against. But it is changing, uh, and our, as I've said earlier, as you know, the knowledge of the pandemic and how the virus has spread gets uh, more full. Our own understanding of that uh, is changing, and the you know, elections are things that usually take quite a long time to lay out a a, a comprehensive plan and to implement that plan and to make adjustments to those plans and all of the elements that lead up to an election and the procedures and materials uh, involved, it's difficult to change those things on short notice, uh, you know, within even, you know, just a few months and to have that go forward in a way that is smooth and acceptable and understood. So I think, I think we're going to have difficult difficulty. A a number of countries are going to have difficulty in holding elections that are going to be um, you know, understood to have been well conducted and where the electoral stakeholders have been treated fairly. I think that the nature of what we're looking at is going to make this challenge uh, a lot bigger. And um, you know, all we can do is, is do the best we can. And, and hopefully the countries administering elections will, will do the best they can. And again, the, at the end of the day, what's one of the most essential characteristics is to be transparent and open about the challenge and the steps that are being taken to address it and to be able to really have open conversations and sharing of information about that. David, thank you very much. Thank you, Elliot. My pleasure. David Carroll is director of the Democracy Program at the Carter Center. If you'd like to comment on the discussion, ask a question, or even suggest a topic for a future episode, drop us a line at podcast at worldpoliticsreview.com. Trend Lines is produced and edited by Peter Dury. You can follow him and WPR on Twitter. And while you're at it, don't forget to sign up for our free daily newsletter. It's the best way to keep up with what we're publishing, and you'll also get a code for a 25% discount off an annual subscription. To sign up, go to wpr.pub slash trendlines. That's wpr.pub slash trendlines. Thanks for listening and tune in again next week.